Good morning. Grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This has been a challenging week, and so we have rather uh, dramatically altered the order of worship. So very little of what you see in front of you by way of order of worship is what we're going to do, but fear not, we'll guide you through this process, and, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to ask the ushers if you'd come forward and just distribute these books. Uh, if you come forward, let us know that you're here, and um, if you're a regular attender, give us your updates on contact information. If you'd like more information about our church, let us know how to be in touch with you. One of the things that certainly has been impressed upon me this week is the need for community and the power of community. There are several things that are happening here today that uh, speak, I think, to that. This afternoon, uh, there will be a movie. Is it Finding Nemo? Is that correct? At 2 o'clock? And it's uh, free. It's for those who want to come. Come and enjoy the movie. Bring your children. Looks like it's going to be a nice day to be inside and go to a movie. So that's at 2 o'clock. And at uh, 5 o'clock, Kurt, would you put up that map for us? This is the um, Sunday that we have a, a church gathering down at the waterfront. And some have said where at the waterfront, where that star is. And the easiest way to find it is to go down, well, the easiest way for me to find it is you go down College Street, take a right onto, is it Lake Street? Go down Lake Street and between the Coast Guard Station and the Moran plant, right? If you go right back there, there's a beautiful area back there. You'll smell good food cooking. You'll see uh, people gathered. And, and that's where it is. And, and everyone is welcome to come if you want to bring uh, some food to share. We're happy to have you do that too, but there will be plenty. So that's this afternoon at 5 o'clock, an opportunity for us to gather to not only say hello, but get to know each other, tell stories, and be grateful to God that we can be together. Also at 5 o'clock here, downstairs in Fellowship Hall is the Soup Supper. And we are currently feeding anywhere from 40 to 90 people, depending on the day. We're so grateful for people who give food, who come and volunteer. If you want to know more about that, you can come, you can volunteer, you can come and eat and, and spend some time with the, the folks, the guests who come and share with us. Um, I, you can talk to Faye and she'll be happy to give you more information about that. Those are what's happening here uh, today. We're talking about evangelism in the 21st century, and I'll say more about this a little bit later. Um, we'll stick to the theme, but our service today is um, really a service of lamentation, of confession, and of reflection. And we're blessed uh, to have with us the, uh, let me see, the Green Mountain Monteverdi Singers of Vermont. Did I do that right? Ensemble. It's a name that's a tad redundant, um, but they do, uh, they do sing some beautiful music. They were in concert here uh, several weeks ago, and were scheduled to come and participate in our service this morning. We've asked them not just to participate, but to lead us through the entire rendering of Thomas Tallis' Lamentations. And uh, Tallis is a Renaissance composer. We think this piece was written some, somewhere between 1560 and 1569. And it takes its uh, inspiration from the Book of Lamentations in the scriptures, a book that maybe doesn't get very much attention, but um, it's a lamentation for the city. And we can substitute uh, Burlington or Dallas or Baton Rouge or Minneapolis or Daytona or any number of places uh, in for the word Jerusalem. Wherever your hometown is, if you're visiting us, you can insert it, the name of that place there. And, and there's at uh, one point in the, in the piece, you'll hear the, uh, the Latin, and I believe this is going to be on the screen. We're going to see the translation on the screen. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord. Be converted and return to the Lord. Well, uh, what is true for cities has to start with individuals. And so uh, for each of us, this is a time to, to reflect on the events of the week, of the past year. And, um, and again, we'll talk more about that. But throughout our service this morning, um, starting in just a moment, we're going to be led through 
these lamentations. It's from Jeremiah chapter one, the first five verses. I, I hope that you will uh, avail yourself of the time to be quiet, to listen, to let the music perhaps carry you away. And I know that not every kind of music meets every one of our desires or needs, but uh, today we're going to go back a few centuries and this, this piece was written for Holy Thursday, uh, the Tenebrae service for Holy Week. So it is a, a piece that invites us to hear the lamentation, uh, to be a people of repentance, of confession, and reflection. So with all of that, let's be together now with gratitude, but also in a spirit of uh, hope, uh, a willingness to be reconciled to God, to our sisters and brothers, to each other, and uh, to in Gauge for a moment in a time of confession and repentance and reflection and lament. Let us pray.
prayer of, pray a prayer of confession based on Matthew chapter 5. Words will be on the screen. I will stand on this side. Rachel will be on this side. And we'll alternate, uh, beginning with this side, the type in the lighter print, and this side will respond with the type in the bolder print. And so let us confess together. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. As with the tears of victims of violence, offering little comfort. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We confess that we continue to send such as these away with their hunger untended and their thirst unassuaged. Blessed are the merciful. We confess that our justice is meted out with prejudice and mercy is often ridiculed as a sign of weakness. Blessed are the pure in heart. We confess that we pay lip service to purity, while those who can get away with it are rewarded. Blessed are the peacemakers. We confess that because we have practiced war for so long, we have forgotten how to make peace. Blessed are those who confess honestly and humbly. We have sinned against God and neighbor, against the peacemakers and the pure in heart. We seek forgiveness from our sisters and brothers and from the one who created us all in the image of God. In our silence, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Restore and reconcile us to God and to each other. Because of who Jesus is, we dare to believe we are forgiven and we rejoice. Amen. Instead of a children's message, I'd like to share a message with parents, with grandparents, with neighbors, with anyone who has a relationship with children. This is something that comes to us from our friend Zach Hogue. Many of you will remember Zach, who was in our church for a while, is currently in Maine. He posted this on Facebook. I've been in touch with him, and I asked if I would have his permission to share it with you today. This was written prior to uh, the killing of the police in Dallas. Last night at bedtime, I had an unexpected conversation with my two oldest children, ages four and six, about what happened to Alton Sterling. I know it seems young, and I felt that way too, when the four-year-old, Pippa, asked me who that family was in the picture on my phone screen. They're so cute, she said. But for some reason, I felt compelled to tell her and her sister the truth. The dad's name is Alton, I said, and it's really very sad, but he was killed. His son is 15 now, I added, and he really misses his daddy. I know it seems young, though, and I felt that way too. But then later on that night, last night, I saw the Falcon Heights shooting in a Facebook Live video only an hour after it actually happened. It was broadcast in real time, and there, right there, after the horrifying image of a man covered in blood and leaving this world, there was a little girl, a little girl talking to her mother. It's okay, mommy, the little girl said, I'm here with you. It seems young, and I felt that way too. But in our bedtime talk, my daughters both seemed to understand perfectly when I explained that for a long time, people with different color skin, especially black people, have been treated so badly in our country. It's not right. They agreed. God loves them exactly the same as God loves everyone, and we should all be treated with exactly the same kindness and respect. 
Our differences are beautiful, not bad. And they both said yes. Then they talked about their friends with brown skin and how they love them. And now Alton's son, well, he's 15 now, and he just misses his daddy so much, I said. And then I started crying, and the six-year-old, Gemma, said, I would miss you if you were gone, Daddy. And Pippa added, I love you. Maybe it was too young, but to one four and six-year-old, they know the story, and they understand. morning. The prayer psalm this morning is uh, the first 11 verses of Psalm 102. It's on page 822 and will be on the screens behind me. I'll read the light print and I invite you to join me in reading the dark print. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is smitten like grass and withered. I am too wasted to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cleave to my flesh. I am like an owl of the wilderness, like a little owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely bird on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink because of your indignation and anger. You have taken me up and thrown me away. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Let's sing together. It's hymn number 605. Words are, I think, on the screen, but also in the hymnal. This is, a, this is really a baptism song. It's a song of blessing for our children, but if we read the words and are attentive to them, I think we will see the text uh, leading us into other places as well. I'll play an introduction, and then I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing.
The scripture this morning is from 1 Chronicles, chapter 13, uh, chapter 16, verses 23 through 34. And I'm reading from the New International uh, Version. You may find it on page 376 in your pew Bible. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing with joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Some of you will remember the scene from Fiddler on the Roof where they're gathered in the synagogue, I believe it was, around the rabbi. And someone says, Rabbi, is there a blessing for the czar? And the rabbi thinks for a moment and says, there's a blessing for everything. Well, what's the blessing for the czar? And he thinks another moment and then he says, God bless and keep the czar far away from us. When I was growing up, if we bought a car, a priest came over in clerical garb with the holy water and blessed the car. I was talking to Bill this morning earlier. We had uh, medals to St. Christopher or, or scapulars. Those were blessed by the priest. When we had a house, the house was blessed. There was a liturgy for everything. Is there a blessing for this? There's a blessing for everything. There's a, a, a liturgy of death and re resurrection. When I was growing up, I remember um, the liturgy for the death of a child, the funeral mass, the Misa de Angelis. I, can, I could still sit at the piano and play the Kyrie from that mass. A beautiful, haunting melody. There were liturgies for Holy Thursday and Good Friday. The only day there's not a liturgy in the Christian tradition is Holy Saturday because in the tradition, God sleeps that day. So there's no liturgy for Holy Saturday, but there is for resurrection and for incarnation. I remember taking my throat to church on the Feast of St. Blaise, two candles held to our throats, a blessing prayers of protection for our throats. That really wasn't the part of me that created the most trouble, but anyway, I'll take a blessing for any part of me that you want to give me a blessing for. We're told that the people of Israel are, are called to worship, and you know, 
from ancient times right till now, how we worship says something about our understanding of God and our understanding of ourselves. For Israel, the way they worshiped set them apart. Now, there were some similarities. Just like today, I suppose, you could go into a, any number of Protestant churches or Catholic churches, any Christian church, and you'd find some similarities. Probably everybody sings Amazing Grace. Our Eucharistic prayers might be similar. So there were some similarities back then, too. But the way they worshiped Yahweh set them apart. And it was, in a sense, a way of proclaiming not only their story, but God's story, God's actions in their lives. So in the month of July, we're talking about evangelism in the 21st century. Last week, we said that, well, the good news, which is what evangel means, the good news, that story, has to begin with your story. What's your story? Because that's where we encounter the power of God, the presence of the Spirit, hope in times of trial ways of offering thanks when something so wonderful happens we don't know who to say thank you to, right? And this week we were going to talk about, and I guess we still are, we're talking about the liturgy and how gathering together is a way of indicating not only who we believe God to be, not only who we believe ourselves to be, but the vision we have for the world. That, that in the liturgy, when supposedly everyone is welcome, when everyone is welcome, we're making a statement. You know, in, a, in times that have become so busy, hectic to the point of being frantic, the notion that anybody would take an hour or an hour and a half or two or however long the service goes, but to carve that time out of the week and come together intentionally to be community. And some people sacrifice to, to get there every week. So important is that witness to be together. It's not just about who God is, who we are, but it's our vision for the world. It says to the world, we can come together. We have some obvious problems in the Christian family with this because we've got two churches just across the street. And, and we get serious about this when we worship, you know, together. We're working on that, maybe. But you get my point. This, is, this says something about who we are. Rachel, in our conversations this week about this service, Rachel was pointing out that as irreligious as so many people are, when somebody dies, who do they call? It ain't the Ghostbusters. It's a pastor. They call a church. They need some way to be gathered, to have hope, to, to experience grace, and maybe even community. The same is true when little ones are born. So uh, the liturgy is one way that we tell the story. And in Chronicles, we're told that, you know, when we gather for liturgy, we're gathering not only with each other, but with all of creation. The trees are out there praising God, their very being an act of worship. And of course, there's that great line in the Gospels where people are complaining about those ones who are praising Jesus. And, and Christ says, if they don't cry out the rocks, the rocks will worship. And it is that great children's song we used to sing at Vacation Bible School back in the day. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out for me. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out for me. Let's see if I can keep going. I'll lift my voice and raise. I'll lift my hands and praise. Something like that. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out for me. Yeah. And so the Chronicle says in, in, in the... In the context of all that is glorious about creation, in the context of all that is good and hopeful about this world, in, in the context of the, the, the imprint of the divine that's in the soul and the spirit of every one of us, worship, praise is going on all the time. I don't know if this is true anymore, but it used to be there was never a moment in the day when there weren't Christians somewhere on the planet gathered for worship. A kind of perpetual, ongoing testimony to the power that we believe is resident in being gathered 
what that says about who we believe God to be, who we believe ourselves to be, and who we believe and what we believe the world can become. But there is a glitch, which I'd like to read for you now from one of the prophets. Speaking for God, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melodies of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Another place, the prophet says, what does the Lord look for in terms of worship? A broken and contrite heart and spirit and openness to who God is and who God calls us to be. So our gatherings have a kind of condemning quality to them in that not everyone has been welcome. Not everyone has been safe. Not everyone is treated equally in the church. At annual conference, we were celebrating the 60th anniversary of the first woman to be ordained in the United Methodist Church. Well, we might be proud of that 60-year history, except it took us 1,940 or 50 years to get there, so we're not really moving at breakneck speed. United Methodist Church, before it was united, the, the Methodist Church split into the churches of the North and the churches of the South. Is that because some people like warm weather and some people like snow? No. It's because we could not agree in terms of who really was welcome. We have whole denominations of Christians who had to come into existence because they were not welcome in places like this. So there's, there's a glitch to our gathering. The fact of the matter is that who we have proclaimed God to be has not always been a biblically accurate depiction of who God is. And let's be honest and say that, I mean, even if we could memorize all of this, we still wouldn't have the whole picture, would we? So our gathering is not only descriptive of who we are, it's prescriptive of who we long to become. It's looking for the day when we don't have to lament anymore. It's clinging to the hope that all people will be welcome and safe and loved. I was talking to a colleague last night, uh, a clergy person of color, who was sharing with me their experiences on the roads of Vermont, being followed, being made to feel not quite safe, in spite of the fact that, to the best of their knowledge, they were doing everything right. I remember attending a meeting. I don't recall what the purpose of the meeting was, but there were about 40 of us clergy there and the guest speaker. And before, as the guest speaker was being introduced, uh, we were asked the question, how many of you were stopped by the police on your way to the meeting today? One hand went up. It was the hand of the guest speaker who was African-American. I have attended two meetings with the police in the last, what, two weeks. And I know the heart there is to serve, the hope there is to keep people safe. I, walk, I, I marched down Church Street several weeks ago, um, surrounded by law enforcement, to make sure that those who were marching could do so safely. Our liturgy has to have this component of confession in it, the admission that we're not yet 
who God wants us to be individually and collectively. This is the hardest thing to do, I think. It can be so hard to say, I'm wrong, this was my fault. That can be so hard to do. Particularly if you're in a place of privilege where, where your imperfections are not all that obvious to you. And I tell you, I, I struggle with this. I've shared with members of our staff, I'm not an activist. I'm not one to carry a sign. I'm not really comfortable protesting. I respect those who are. But I fear that in order to faithfully follow Jesus, I'm going to have to at least show up. I mean, I'm going to have to at least acknowledge in some public way that things are not right. And also have to acknowledge that leaders have to take risks, have to be willing to get it wrong if we're serious about getting it right. And so this is my prayer, and I won't impose it on you. We've prayed our prayer of confession. But for me, who benefits from white privilege, I confess to persons of color that I've not imagined the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. My failure, our failure of imagination is our unwillingness to act. We have used feigned ignorance as an excuse to perpetuate racist systems which disseminate power disproportionately in favor of those who already wield it. We've pushed the red and the yellow and the brown and the black ones up against the wall and we've held them there with insufficient housing and economic oppression and inadequate education. And we have tried to convince them, and maybe the them is you, some of you, that it is enough to survive. And we are shocked and dismayed by their expressed desire to thrive. We expect absolution for our sin from them, absent any willingness to share our blessings with them. May the shallowness of our confession be held up before us until we yield the halls of power, acknowledge the gifts they have given, honor their murdered dead with something more substantive than words at memorials and platitudes at protests. Begging forgiveness is not enough. Claiming the grace of forgiveness is to trivialize its power. For us privileged here, now, in these days of tragedy, if we truly mean the prayer of confession, then we acknowledge that forgiveness is something we are going to have to earn. Let us pray. In our worship, God, we experience the power of the Spirit, ancient, sacred music can be a trigger for us, leading us to a place not only of quiet, but of honesty, recognizing that a lamentation from long ago can still be heard in our streets today. 
We pray for ourselves and for our neighbors. We pray for those called upon to protect us, to govern us. And we pray that we would be a people willing to confess, ready to risk, and that when we gather here for worship, in truth, because Jesus is head of the church, everyone is welcome, is a full participant, is a sister and a brother. This we pray in the name of the Christ. Amen. Okay. We're going to give our gifts and our tithes and uh, as that's done, we're going to listen again. And uh, I pray that we will give and we will listen prayerfully.
another as hurting people in a hurting world. For many of us, there is the overwhelming question of what should I do? Prayer is not the last thing, but it is the first thing. So in that spirit, let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, we are hurting for people near to our hearts and around the world. We have witnessed and experienced pain again and again as recent events have unfolded. This day, we gather in prayer asking for comfort, for healing, for strength, for wisdom, and above all, for peace and justice. We pray for comfort and healing for those who have lost their lives or their loved ones due to violence, especially the names and groups that we lift up now. For Alton Stone. Lando Castillo. Those in the Dallas Police Department. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for healing and strength for those who continue to live in fear and struggle due to systemic oppression, especially the names and groups that we lift up now. For people of color all over our nation. immigrants in our nation. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for comfort, wisdom, and peace for those charged with protecting us, especially these names and groups we lift up now. Burlington Police Department. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for wisdom and a spirit of peace for those charged with making laws that can limit violence in our country. We pray especially for these names. For Peter Welsh, Patrick Leahy, and Bernie Sanders. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for comfort and peace for communities in our nation who are mourning the lost now and long after the news cycle forgets about them, especially those in Baton Rouge. Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for comfort, healing, strength, wisdom, justice, and peace for ourselves, that we might know what to do to help make this world, your world, a more peaceful place for all of your children, no matter the color of their skin, their country of origin, their faith, who they love, or how they live their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Beloved God, you love us, your children, so deeply, and we thank you for your love. We know that you weep with us and comfort us because you sent Jesus to show us your love. And while he was here with us, he taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
I've no doubt that our sisters and brothers of color would take a service like this out singing. They would begin with lament and they would end with hope. They would begin with cries of grief. They would end with shouts of joy. Our United Methodist hymnal is laced with the spirituals. You can hardly go 20 pages without coming to one. We're not going to sing it because we need to do it first. Let's go out and let the light of Christ shine. You might have to make a point of it. You might have to step out of your comfortable way. You might have to do it intentionally. Be aware this week of the call, the invitation to let your light shine, to let the light of Christ shine. And maybe next week we'll sing it. It's 585. Let's do it first. And as we go, let's go knowing that God is blessing us. In the name of the one who is mother and father of us all, who is the Christ, who is the sustainer, the spirit, go and be a blessing. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Blessings to you all. Thank you.